Good afternoon. Slava Ukraini. My name is Roman Britan. I'm the program director for 1017 World FM Radio in Edmonton, and perhaps more importantly today, uh, the uh, uh, producer of the Daily Ukrainian program at that radio station. And it's my pleasure to be the uh, master of ceremonies at this event. And we welcome you to the Euromaidan project, The Art of Revolution. Personally, if I may begin on a personal note, I must say that uh, the events in Ukraine, if nothing else, have certainly uh, tweaked the imagination of the Ukrainian community. <coughs> Never have I seen a community that has so, so aware of what's going on in Ukraine, not from day to day, but hour to hour. As we contact our friends and say, did you hear what happened? They usually retort, oh no, no, that, that, that you know, you haven't heard what's happened since then. Because we all know how this has been proceeding. Uh, at lightning fast speed, the most unexpected moments of course happening, the reactions, and before the reactions are completed, there's something else to react to. From the perspective of the radio program, the Ukrainian show, I can tell you, I have never uh, experienced a time where there is so much material to cover that you can't do it in the allotted airtime. Nevertheless, the events and Euromaidan, of course, now, finally, have hit the front pages and is the lead item in most of the world's media, both electronic and print. And it's very timely, this exhibit, isn't it? It couldn't, have been, uh, it couldn't have been expected, of course, or foreseen, the circumstances under which we are now looking at these posters, but that in and of itself is an interesting concept. Looking at these posters today may garner a different reaction to us than it, may have, than it might have four or five or six days ago, just in the context of what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, there's a few people that I would like to welcome. Uh, first of all, we're very delighted that we uh, have the uh, Member of Parliament for Edmonton Strathcona with us, Linda Duncan. Linda, welcome. On behalf of the Ukrainian community in Edmonton, I would like to express thanks to two uh, writers in the print media who have gotten the ball rolling, certainly, by bringing the news about this exhibit to the community and have been covering extensively the events happening in Ukraine and making it front page news, and that's the Edmonton Journal's staff writer, Fish Grukowski, and the Edmonton Examiner's Douglas Johnson. They're not with us, but we should give them a round of applause, I think. Also, on behalf of St. John's Institute, thank you to the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, Alberta Provincial Council, and their president, Olesya Lutsiu Andriovich, who is here today, for keeping this issue at the forefront, for organizing fundraisers, uh, car rallies, as we know we had our own Auto Maidan here in Edmonton, and other events to support the protesters and the Euromaidan movement in Ukraine. And uh, thanks to the uh, people at St. John's Institute who are behind hosting this exhibit. And a special thank you to Dr. Bohdan Kordan for sending it here, and I'll speak about him in just a second. It's funny because the perspective of how events such as this are covered and reflected in artwork has changed completely and so rapidly in recent times. Recently, in an interview about what Maidan is all about, there was a quote in a, uh, an e-newsletter of a, of a young man called Denis, who considers himself a bit of a radical and a political scientist. But listen to this interesting des uh, description of things. You should understand that from the very beginning, people had a very peculiar understanding of Europe. In Ukraine, they pictured Europe as a very utopian ideal, society without corruption, society with high wages, social security, rule of law, honest politicians, smiling faces, and of course, clean streets, etc., and called it EU. When one tried to tell them that the actual EU has, yes, many positive qualities, but not exactly anything to do with this pretty picture, that people occasionally there burn EU flags in protest, and that they protest against austerity, the most interesting retort, though, comes back from the Maidanyutsi. So, would you better live in Russia, then? <laughs> interesting how uh, the choices sometimes are not the most ideal. There's been many comparisons done to the Orange Revolution of 2004 in Ukraine, of course. Uh, many feel that the base for this Maidan uh, was created on the, on the uh, experience of that event. And there's probably some truth in that. But analysts have said that one of the major differences, though, between Euromaidan and the 2004 protests has been the use of new media, of social networks, and other IT tools to 
to organize and sustain the protests, both in communicating and in sending the message out to the world, plus in finding out what the world is saying and how they are reacting both to the government and to themselves uh, between each other. That said, then, we're looking now at a completely different art form than we might have a couple of decades ago, because much of this, of course, was created by the use of IT technology. Much of this, of course, is graphics that happened on computers, and the idea behind the size of these posters is so that they can be quickly distributed, quickly copied, quickly printed on home computers and sent out and made uh, so they can make their impact in a timely fashion. Uh, they're, very, they're very small. We're going to give you an opportunity to see them on the screen here because as we uh, roll them for a little while here, I uh, would like to, insofar as Dr. Cordan could not be with us today, uh, play for you a few edited excerpts of an interview that we aired recently with him about this exhibit that will give us some context as to what the exhibit is all about, his thoughts about it, and uh, the reasons that he feels that it's important to get this out to the world. So this is my uh, a bit of my interview with Dr. Bodan Kordan, Professor of Political Science, Chair of the Prairie Center for Ukrainian Studies at St. Thomas More College, University of Saskatchewan. Tell us, first of all, what, uh, what the Euromaidan project is and uh, how, how it came to be. Well, um, essentially it's a, an exhibit, an exhibit of uh, 50 selected posters uh, that circulated widely on the Maidan. I came across them as, uh, as we all have been looking very intently on, on the Internet about developments in Ukraine. I was really struck by you know, these images that kept on floating circuitously in the, um, in the Maidan, and these were images of graphic art, graphic artistic images of, you know, um, of personalities, but also in many ways of events that were taking place. And um, the idea crossed my mind that this is something that probably should be shared uh, more widely. And, and in, in part, I was doing my bit for the Euromaidan. I mean, the intent, I think, of a lot of these posters there was largely to sort of inform uh, the, the public in cave, um, but I think more uh, more widely informing the general population about what the Maidan stood for, what is the aspirations, what were the values behind it, and so on and so forth. So uh, this exhibit, in many ways, grows out of it. Now, uh, in, in curating this, uh, how did you arrive at the uh, 50 that you selected? Well, a lot of these images, in effect, are sort of created by graphic artists who would encourage people to uh, print them on their home computers. And they made these things available either through Facebook or through D Dropbox, one or the other. And uh, so there are literally hundreds of these things that are circulating um, on the web and the like. I chose uh, about 100 or so and pared these down to 50. And I think that they really sort of speak to the storyline of, of the Maidan, of you know, how it originated, what were the issues, and then in effect how, it is, how it's evolved. The exhibit sort of ends at the end of December, so the posters uh, are really reflect the sentiments and expressions of, of political frustration in, the, in that earlier period. The posters uh, were selected because they do sort of capture that narrative. Interestingly, the narrative is accompanied by 11 first-hand accounts of people who are on the Maidan, who have published either on web journals or uh, on Facebook and the like, and I've selected these to accompany the, the posters. So they really sort of cover uh, sort of the range of, of events that have occurred between November and December. Right. Well, notwithstanding the fact that, of course, uh, Maidan is um, now the lead story pretty much in all international media and is very much a, a living story, a developing one, uh, which makes these posters all the more relevant, I would say, at the moment. Uh, but setting that aside for a moment, uh, from an overall perspective, would you say that these posters have more value from a sociological point of view or, or, or artistically? Both. I, I, I think p part of it, uh, going to this issue of uh, sociology, in many ways this is a political sociology. This is the, the, sort of the messages that are inherent in these po posters, in effect, I think, are still relevant today. But it's important to see uh, precisely what were p people insisting on, what, uh, what were they... Uh, struggling uh, for, to achieve, and then as it is now, it, it remains relevant. And we see the sort of the gestation of civil society. We begin to see how, in effect, people are mobilizing in its own defense through this medium, asking people ultimately to think consciously about why they're there on the Maidan, to think consciously and invite others to 
uh, ask themselves about what they can do as uh, you know uh, as well. So I, I see this as an extraordinary expression of of, of society uh, evolving, um, being sort of conscious politically of uh, of uh, its own role in its own destiny. But it does this in a very interesting way. The sort of subtitle of this exhibit is the political aesthetics. These are wonderfully crafted images. They are extraordinary images. They are sort of uh, beautiful to look at, creative in their their design, because the nature of posters require the message to be clear, uncompromising, succinct, so that in effect, as you're as you're walking through this kind of chaotic environment, you see the poster, you know what it means, and it registers with you, and you don't necessarily ask. What next? So the aesthetics of this, well, I think, is is profoundly moving as well. So uh, aesthetically, uh, these are uh, these are gems. The story you have been done certainly is one of uh, an evolution. Uh, it was it's been a very dramatic evolutionary process since the end of November until today. Uh, so much so, I'd say that some people are hesitant to even call it Euromaidan anymore because the focus has has shifted in so many other different directions. I'm just wondering, today today's Maidan, uh, have you had a chance to? Uh, to peruse the artwork that's coming out, and is, is it different from what we would have seen in November, December? It's somewhat different. I mean, it captures uh, the issue of sacrifice. The nature of the posters that, that uh, reveal, uh, talk about sacrifice, and in, then, uh, and in, in this regard, it's different from the earlier period. At that point, it really was about broken promises, uh, but this is really about the future, especially in light of uh, the recent tragedy and the brutal assault against the Maidan. So it's, a, it's a, a different quality, but the message is still the same. It really is about, you know, what kind of future do you want? And in this regard, uh, perhaps in some respect, the posters may have moved away from that initial concern about Europe and belonging through the association agreement, agreement you know, part of the European family. Uh, it's gone beyond that largely because I think that the sentiment uh, is it's gone beyond Europe and perhaps maybe even is part of Europe. In what sense? Uh, these individuals, in effect, are talking about dignity and freedom, which is really you know the, at the heart of the European conventions. Um, and here you have individuals, in effect, who are prepared to live and die for it. Uh, whereas in Europe, they take it for granted. Uh, so I think that if you want to look at the beating heart of Europe, you look to Ukraine, you look to Kiev, you look to the Maidan. So thanks to Dr. Kordan for at least being here virtually, if not uh, in person. He very much regretted that he couldn't make it today and would have loved, of course, to have him here. Uh, some people may be wondering why St. John's Institute felt it was very important to be a part of this exhibit and to bring it to the community. Well, for one thing, of course, there is a relevance note simply from the fact that uh, several of our residents here, many of the staff, are from Ukraine originally, perhaps even very recently. So they have very direct and live connections to family and others who have been and continue to be involved in Yaromaidan and the associated protests. At this time, it's my pleasure to call upon the chair of the board of St. John's Institute to uh, welcome you. Uh, the, uh, please join me in welcoming to the microphone, Dr. Tanya Maisak. I'd like to thank you all for coming and, and just reflect on a moment that um, I, as I've been watching the Olympics and my Twitter feed filling up with my Don, I'm struck that I'm a Ukrainian in many ways and I'm also a Canadian. And early on in all these protests, the singer Ruslana from Ukraine was talking about how you, the diaspora, you left. You left to make better lives for yourself, but we remain. We are fighting for this, for this freedom, for the ability to live without being beaten by police here. So do what you can, wherever you are, to help us. And I think that's what St. John's Institute is trying to do today. We have a long history in our organization of being related to education. And so this is what we do. We provide education to all of you who are here now as to why this is happening in Ukraine, what the people there want, how they are no different than us in their aspirations to have safe, helpful, wonderful lives, to have their children grow in a safe community. So again, I'd like to thank you for coming and for participating with us. We want this open to the public. We want you to spread the word. We want other people to come and also see this. Thank you very much.